everyone and welcome to APS Webinars. The title of today's webinar is Considering a Career at a National Laboratory, the first in the Physics Career Exploration Series that we are launching this fall. I'm Crystal Bailey and I'll be your host for today's broadcast. Thank you all so much for joining us. APS Webinars are brought to you as a service of the American Physical Society, connecting you with the expertise of individuals who can offer insight into physics careers, educational programs, and professional development for students, working physicists, and educators. Peter, can you advance the slide? So APS membership gives you easy access to valuable career information and resources like this webinar. It allows you to get your research out to the community and network with potential employers or colleagues at our meetings and have a greater positive impact about issues that are important to you through grad grassroots advocacy and find a community of like-minded folks through participation in our forums, divisions, and topical groups. So uh, you do not have to be an APS member to access these webinars, but if you aren't one yet and you value things that APS provides, I would encourage you to consider joining today you can go to the URL at the bottom of the screen and uh, join APS. Okay, Peter, next slide, please. Okay, so today's presentation features Peter Fisk, who you see there, and I will introduce in more detail in a second. But first, I do wanna do a little bit of housekeeping. The first portion of the broadcast will be Peter's presentation, and then we will have a period of Q&A at the end. If you would like to ask a question, please type it into the questions panel located on the right side of your screen. And you can see it looks like this little panel here. Um, you can submit questions or responses uh, through the questions panel at any time, and we will see that uh, during the webinar. You can also use that little orange arrow at the top to open and close your panel if you want to look at the full screen. Um, a link to the recording of today's presentation will be emailed to you after the event. It, it is being recorded, and if you registered, um, you will receive an automatic email from GoToWebinar that contains the recording. Uh, we will send that in about 48 hours after the conclusion of the broadcast. We need a little time to upload that video. And there's also a survey that we will we encourage you to complete upon exiting so that we can continue to improve our ability to provide you with these valuable services. One more thing, Peter, if you can advance one more. Really quickly, before we dive in, um, we do have a couple of broadcasts coming up. It isn't quite advanced yet. Okay, there we go. A couple broadcasts that are coming up. We're also launching simultaneously with this series, the Success in Industry Careers series. Um, and you can see that we have a couple of broadcasts coming up next week, why you should consider an industry career that will be hosted by yours truly, <laughs> Crystal Bailey. And the week after that, two weeks after that, rather, um, a, a crash course on return on investment, which is a very important concept uh, for, for industry settings. So if you want to sign up for that, um, you can go to the APS webinars list and make sure that you check at the bottom success in industry careers. Um, and if you want to sign up for the Physics Career Exploration Series, you can also indicate that there. Okay, now moving forward, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Um, Peter, if you can advance one more. Peter Fisk is the executive. Crystal, I'm going to hop off briefly and switch my internet because I am seeing some very bad internet uh, connectivity on my end. So stand by everybody. Okay. I'm just going to drop out and drop right back in. Okay. Well, I will continue to introduce Peter <laughs> as he is doing that. Um, so Peter Fisk is the executive director for the National Alliance for Water Innovation, uh, NAWI, a coalition between labs, universities, and U.S. water companies committed to developing game-changing technologies to enable distributed desalination and water reuse. He is a serial entrepreneur, seasoned senior executive, nationally recognized speaker, and author of one of the most widely read career strategy guides for early career scientists and engineers, Put Your Science to Work. And if you haven't had a chance to check out his book, um, you can look it up online. It's an amazing read. It's extremely popular. Um, Peter also has extensive experience in the national lab space, having served as director 
for the Water Energy Resilience Research Institute at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and earlier as a postdoc at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. This broadcast is um, the last of a series of wonderful presentations that Peter has given over the summer as part of the summer webinar series. You can go to our website, um, I think it's go.aps.org slash APS webinars will be our main webinar site. And you can look at recordings of everything that Peter's done. Um, he's also given an extremely popular careers workshop at the APS March meeting for the past 10 years, which is where I have gotten to know him. Um, and Peter, so I'm still seeing your slides. Are you still on audio? I hope so. Can you hear me? Can hear you perfectly. Good, good. I switched to another, uh, another, uh, uh ip source so fingers crossed we'll have no problems now okay well you're you're on so so take it away great all right everybody well <clears throat> first of all it's been great to be with you this summer and to share with you um some of our thoughts on communication on strategy in communication but crystal and i thought it'd be really great to wind up the seminar on a specific note of considering a career at a national laboratory. And so a little bit about me and my longtime relationship with national labs. I got my PhD in material science and geochemistry at Stanford, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so for me, one really nice thing about my environment was that I had a national lab very close by, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and I was a postdoc there from 1994 to 1996. I then went to work for a year in Washington, D.C., and in that year, I actually worked in the Pentagon, and the U.S. Department of Defense is another major technology agency that runs some national labs, and that gave me some experience of comparing and contrasting national labs to, uh, from the Department of Energy from other national labs. I then went back to, as a research scientist at Lawrence Livermore Lab for another four years and then left and started a series of companies. but have now returned for the last three years at another DOE National Lab, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So, um, so I have gone the full circuit and some of my comments today are reflective mostly of what I see today as kind of the key issues and opportunities associated with early career people working at a national laboratory. Now, as um, Crystal said, uh, why don't you open up the questions window now and I'm sure you'll have questions as we go along and type those questions in as you think of them. And then at the end of uh, what I, my prepared remarks, we will come back and have a thorough discussion to the top of the hour. Also to remind you, um, my interest in careers and career development for young scientists extends beyond just being in a national lab. I've also written on the subject of career development for scientists for many years and have lectured at a number of universities. I probably have even visited one of the campuses that you're at right now. Um, and so with all that experience, I wanted to turn my attention to this very uh, interesting opportunity of life in the Department of Energy. So let's start with some basics. The US Department of Energy, what everybody calls DOE, is a government agency that has four basic missions. It has a mission in clean energy innovation, It has a general scientific mission of scientific leadership and discovery. It controls and manages the research surrounding nuclear weapons and other um, you know, global threats like uh, uh, nuclear weapons proliferation. And then the fourth mission is that as we built nuclear weapons in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, we created a large amount of environmental um, uh, uh, consequences and so the DOE is also the world's largest environmental remediation agency. And most of its environmental remediation is around these centers in the 40s, 50s, and 60s where we produce nuclear weapons. So that's the basic mission of the US Department of Energy. There are 17 DOE laboratories, and these are called FFRDCs. What does that stand for? It means federally funded research and development centers. And the DOE DOE runs 17 of them, but there are a total across all the um, federal agencies in the United States. So it's interesting, I think, that the Department of Energy runs close to a third, more than a third of all of the FFRDCs in the United States. Now, 
I'm introducing to several acronyms because life in the Department of Energy uh, would not be complete without a whole uh, pages and pages of acronyms. So here's another acronym for you, GOCO, G-O-C-O. -O. That stands for a laboratory that is government owned, but contractor operated. That means, for example, um, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab where I work, I am actually not a Department of Energy employee. I'm not a federal employee. I am actually an employee of the University of California. The University of California is a contractor that operates Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, runs the laboratory, and employs all the people at the laboratory. Okay, so 16 of the 17 DOE laboratories are GOCOs, and one is called a GOGO, a government owned, government operated lab. That is the National Energy Technolo Technology Laboratory in Morgantown, West Virginia. And the scientists at um, NETL, National Energy Technology Laboratory, are federal employees. Okay, so that's the basics of like what this agency is and what it does. Um, I will also point out that there is a very nice um, annual report that is published by the DOE, the latest of which was done in 2017. The current administration didn't, didn't find it important, sadly, to keep this up, but the 2017 report is excellent and provides a very good and deep dive into these laboratories even has profiles about each of the laboratories. So that's definitely a recommend for those of you who are interested in exploring a career at a national lab. Okay, so the other interesting things about these national labs is that they are distributed across the United States, but not uniformly. And this is part of the history of the Department of Energy. The Department of Energy, when it was created, sort of swept up several independent agencies. So for example, the Atomic Energy Agency, which was doing research on high energy physics, as well as nuclear power, et cetera, had some facilities, including Fermilab in Illinois, uh, Brookhaven National Lab, uh, and those facilities got swept into the DOE. The DOE also had the nuclear weapons uh, laboratories, Los Alamos, India, and Lawrence Livermore. And then you have a group of other laboratories which are called science laboratories, 17 in total, and here's where they're located. But from a standpoint of like portfolio, the laboratories come in very specific flavors. And so you have sort of a range of activity from science on the left, science-oriented laboratories, to technology-oriented laboratories on the right. Technology-oriented laboratories tend to have more engineering, more systems uh, analysis and systems design, whereas the science laboratories are where you find people doing basic scientific research and applied scientific research. Okay, so you have them either in, going from the left to the right, we have multi-purpose science laboratories, Brookhaven, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, Argonne Oak Ridge, Pacific Northwest National Lab, and a little bit about SLAC. These laboratories have multiple um, scientific missions, for example, biology, chemistry, physics, even math and computer science. Then the next, uh, group here, Fermilab, Jefferson, P Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, Ames, and SLAC tend to be laboratories built around a single large device or um, instrument. For example, Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory is built around the large plasma physics research and tokamak that exists on the campus of Princeton University. Those labs are smaller and more specialized. On the right-hand side, we have the Energy Technologies Laboratories, NREL, Idaho National Lab, and NETL, these three laboratories are all focused on a specific office within the Department of Energy. And then finally, on the outside, multi-purpose security labs, Lawrence Livermore, Los Alamos, and Sandia work on nuclear weapons and other classified research. And then finally, at the bottom, you have Savannah River National Lab, which is an environmental laboratory. And it's important for you to understand how these labs connect to DOE's structure and mission, because most of the funding for the research that goes on at these national labs is coming from these various offices within the Department of Energy. So it's important for you to understand which offices connect to which laboratories. So for example, let's start with the security laboratories, Los Alamos, Livermore, and Sandia. They report up to the Office of the Undersecretary for Nuclear Security. Now there is some science that goes on in those laboratories, and they do uh, plenty of non-classified research, but the bulk of their funding and the bulk of their mission orients around nuclear security. As I said, there are these three energy technology laboratories, NREL, Idaho National Lab, and NETL. 
Each of them is connected to a specific office within the Office of Undersecretary for Science and Energy. Each of them are essentially dedicated laboratories for those offices. Then you have the science laboratories. Uh, and these science laboratories, both small and large, all report up to the Office of Science here. And they have, again, a broad set of missions, but all basically accountable to the Office of Science. And then there's Little Savannah River here at the end. And Savannah River is important, as I said, because the DOE, most people don't realize this, the DOE has more environmental re remediation activity than the EPA because they have these large sites around the United States with contaminated soil and contaminated groundwater. And so they're continuing to pioneer research in how to remediate these, um, these uh, uh, areas. Okay, so that's how this set of 17 laboratories connects and that's, that's their background. Uh, in terms of vital statistics, the DOE is roughly, um, you know, it's a large agency and the labs receive about $14 billion per year. And you can see the breakdown between na national nuclear security agency funding and science funding, energy funding, and outside sponsored funding. There are almost 58,000 FTEs. There's another acronym for you. It stands for full-time equivalent positions and 12 185 joint faculty. There are typically around 2,300 postdocs at the national labs at any given moment, and more than 2,000 graduate student researchers who are literally on the campus of these national labs doing research. There's also a large population of undergraduate students. Now, one of the things that many of you may have encountered at a national lab is that they have these user facilities, large specialty equipment that you can actually apply to use. There are, on our Average around 33,000 individual researchers who come to use a DOE user facility at one of these national laboratories. And even beyond the user facilities, we have more than 10,000 visiting scientists. So it is a big enterprise and it employs a lot of physicists and physical scientists. So my calculation here is, is very simple. Let's assume that the average postdoc in the last two years, let's assume that the average career. Uh, scientist is about lasts about 20 years. So if you take all these positions and divide by those numbers, it, it turns out that there's something like 4,000 new positions advertised every year across these national labs, 4,000 research jobs. So it is a significant employment opportunity for early career scientists and physical scientists like yourselves. So where does the DOE fit? And a lot of people uh, who are coming out of grad school sometimes are curious with the question of how the DOE works relative to universities. For example, are they the same? Do they do the same work? I'm waiting here to make sure that uh, connectivity remains okay. Uh, yeah, just Peter, want to check. Crystal, can you see the uh, the slide? We can see the slide, and we can still hear you, though it is it is cutting out a little. That the audio. Okay, very good. Well, now you see this graph. Okay, so one of the important things to um, to think about is where national labs fit in the area of technology maturation in the university environment where most of you have been. You've been doing basic and applied research which is down here at this end of the scale. And the DOE labs do a little bit of basic research, but their main efforts tend to be at larger scale projects. Most of the big dollars are spent on large demonstrations that are essentially outside the scale that a university could execute. Also, the DOE lab sits in this region here, what's called sort of the Valley of Death, where technologies could be demonstrated that they could possibly work, but they need to be scaled up. And so DOE is often in the business of taking emerging scientific breakthroughs and scaling them up to large scale devices and large scale demonstrations. And that scale up is necessary for industry to take over and deal with the commercialization. So DOE has a very important role to play in the US innovation ecosystem. Now, another way to think about this is that you're used to an academic career because you've been in the academic environment. And academic careers are about PI, or principal investigator-led research. And academic careers 
are about teaching. And those two things really are the hallmark of an academic career. The big difference with a national lab career is national lab careers are about team science. They are about a large bunch of innovators coming together to build something larger than any individual research group could build on their own. This is an image from Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory in, I think, 1946. This is one of the large uh, synchrotrons that Ernest Lawrence and his team designed and built. And in fact, Ern Ernest Lawrence, E.O. Lawrence, is really the research scientist, the physicist at UC Berkeley, who's credited with the first conceptualization of large scale projects and team science. And that theme of team science is something you would hear again and again if you interviewed for a postdoc or a staff position at one of the national laboratories. It's in a very important hallmark of life at a national lab. So let's talk about a career in a national laboratory. So for starters, let's compare and contrast to something you may know more about an academic career versus a national lab career, okay? So an academic career, what do you do? You are hired to teach, and in many cases, depending on your department, you are encouraged or even required to also have a research program. At a national lab, you are hired to do research, and there may be options to teach, but that is not the primary mission of the organization. In an academic career, you're given nine months of, of uh, essentially support, nine months uh, in which you teach, and then three months are quote unquote free for you to find funding to do your research. At a national lab, you are paid full time, but the support that comes to, to support your salary comes from specific projects. And so you always have to be working on one or more specific projects with funding. In an academic career, you get quote unquote tenure, after five to six years. In a national lab, you can get a postdoc. You can go from a postdoc or what's called a term appointment, which has a finite duration, to a quote-unquote staff position, which is essentially a permanent position after five to six years. So it's a similar time frame. But in an academic career, if you're in a physics department, you remain in the physics department. You stay in your discipline. Whereas in a national lab, it is much more likely that as a scientist, you're going to experience and even be encouraged to have some more disciplinary mobility. You may collaborate with material scientists, chemists, biologists, et cetera. And then finally, an academic career does have pathways into academic management, department chairs, deans, other managers of the university enterprise. And similarly at a national lab, there are pathways into lab and research management as well. But there are differences. In the academic environment uh, is much looser in general. An academic environment is, for example, completely indifferent to the nationality of uh, staff, whereas the national laboratories, because some of them work on classified research, can be very sensitive to the nationality of their staff. And there are some uh, countries, you know, depending on the administration who suddenly picks a fight with various countries, there are some countries that suddenly can be uh, on, a, on a sensitive or, or terrorist watch list. And if you are a citizen of that country, it can make it much more difficult for you to navigate in and through the national lab sector. For example, in academia, it's loose. Foreign travel, no big deal. As long as you have money in your account, you can book that trip to China or wherever to do your research. For example, at a national lab in, in environment, foreign travel is much more carefully reviewed, much greater concern. And I would also say that in an academic environment, it's not uncommon to get a startup package uh, of support, to, but what they're doing is they're giving you some initial funding so that you can get grants for further research so that you can eventually support a research group. In a national lab, when you start, you are typically being hired into a specific project that already has funding. And so you come into the door with a project to support you, but the assumption and expectation is that your career, as it grows, you will start winning your own projects and you'll be growing your own support down the road. A lot of people say that the academic environment is low cost and there's certainly plenty of elements of it that are low cost. Um, labor, mostly in the form of graduate students, as you guys know, is very inexpensive. And people said that the national lab environment is quote unquote expensive, but we'll get into this a little bit differently. It depends on what you are um, buying. 
Some things can be expensive, but some things can actually be easier to national lab. In an academic environment, the mantra is publish or perish. In national lab, the mantra is make an impact. And you can either make an impact into a DOE program or to one of our national mission, missions, or frankly, be part of a team that's instrumental in making an impact. And so it's not to say that national labs do not encourage publication in peer-reviewed literature, they do. But the national lab environment is about getting results and it is not unusual for a scientist, for example, to work on a very specific project for five years and might only have one or two peer-reviewed scientific publications during that time, for example, because the instrument itself might take three years to build or commission. Then, of course, the differences. In the academic environment, uh, you have intellectual freedom as long as you can get funding. And haha, -ha, same thing in the national lab environment. You can have intellectual freedom as long as you get funding. So in both cases, you need to think about how you grow your quote unquote intellectual business, how you differentiate yourself as a researcher and find interesting problems that sponsors are willing to support. <clears throat> now in an academic environment, labor is cheap, but equipment is expensive. What I mean by that is that the labor in an academic environment is typically in the form of graduate students and postdocs. And they're actually surprisingly inexpensive, as you know, because you're paid peanuts, right? However, managing and running a large piece of equipment in an academic setting is expensive because for the most part, academic environments have a hard time maintaining year after year after year infrastructure support for large equipment. In contrast, at a national lab, it's labor that's expensive, but equipment is quote unquote cheap. That is, this isn't to say it costs less, but at a national lab, a national lab is designed to support and <clears throat> run major pieces of scientific equipment. That's kind of what the whole apparatus is built for. And so I find it much easier if you're gonna contemplate building a one, two, or five, five million dollar scientific apparatus that a national lab might actually be easier place for you. They also have a whole bunch of support for that, including engineering, fabrication, and some very precision procurement. Believe it or not, procurement can be a very important part of building large pieces of scientific apparatus. <clears throat> what is success in an academic environment? Success is good teaching reviews, plus at least a decent research and publications record. That will equal, equal success, that will equal, equal tenure. In the national lab environment, good performance reviews, plus quote, impactful contributions and funding is what leads to success and promotion. <clears throat> But I want to get back to this, labor is cheap, equipment is expensive, and labor is expensive and equipment is cheap. This is one of the places where I see a big opportunity for both sides, the national lab environment and the academic environment. Because you know, it is actually quite hard to hire an early career scientist into the national lab because a researcher needs to commit to the laboratory that they have a steady supply of research dollars to support that new scientist, okay? so. It's very hard to know that you have the long-term business to support a new hire. In contrast, in academia, grad students are fluxing through a program all the time. And so I see a perfect synergy coming from a lot of collaborators and researchers, early career researchers, grad students and postdocs, being in academia, but collaborating with the national lab scientists who have these spectacular tools that um, are very valuable for research. <clears throat> so that's just one thing to think about. Now, how do you get in to either one? Uh, we'll call these on-ramps. In academia, you know the on-ramps. They have a, uh, an application, they have a, a position that's posted, they do the search nationally or even internationally, and most academic searches in physics or the physical sciences attract more than 100 applicants. Now, <clears throat> Sometimes a strategy is in your early career to go and consider a wider range of academic environments. So maybe you're not going to get an assistant professorship at Stanford right off the bat. Maybe you'll start someplace smaller, maybe a University of Iowa. But with time, if you build your research group and you grow your program, you can potentially then move, especially if you get tenure at the University of Iowa. It gives you a certain degree of mobility to move to another research organization. 
But remember that research universities come in a very specific set of flavors. If you're not familiar with the Carnegie categories, you should uh, look at the Wikipedia page on this. The Carnegie Institute classifies research universities into R1, R2. R1 universities obtain a lot from federal census at an R1 university. R2 universities do the same thing, but they tend to have smaller scale of research. So it's not uncommon for people to consider going from an R2 university and after a couple of years trying to move up to an R1 university. But if you start at a university that doesn't train PhDs or doesn't have a strong track record of winning research dollars, it's very hard to grow a research program, which means it's very hard to grow your, your uh, reputation, which means it's harder for you to potentially move up to that research environment. Not impossible, but it's just harder. Now, in contrast, the most common on-ramp to a national lab staff job is by being a postdoc. And the next most common is being a postdoc. Postdoc, postdoc, postdoc. It is a very common pathway for research scientists at a national lab to first do a postdoc, and then if their research and interests align, then that turns into a term appointment, which then, if the research funding is, is uh, secure, can turn into a staff position. Now, those staff positions are still often advertised, and those advertisements are national, and they mostly attract 100 plus applicants. But the po former postdoc who is applying for that position has an inside shot at this because she knows a lot about the research, she's already started, some uh, collaborations and she's much more known and familiar to the national lab managers making the hiring decision. Now, that doesn't mean that you do have open applications and have other people apply and win these positions, they do. But in general, postdocs and early career scientists are uh, have a much bigger advantage because they have familiarity with the environment. Um, and another way to uh, explore and consider uh, whether a national laboratory career is right for you is to simply align your research with the research within the labs. And that can be a variety of things, either the topics that you're working on or having collaborations with um, uh, national lab scientists or simply using some of the user facilities at these national laboratories. But I would say user facilities and research collaborations are two principal mechanisms for you to begin to explore and see whether a national lab setting might be an ideal place for you. Now, I will also point out that you notice that map on slide five. National labs are in very specific locations, which means there are some universities that have quote unquote special relationships with national laboratories. Let's look at California. We have uh, Los, uh, Lawrence Livermore Lab in Sandia, California, and SLAC, the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, and Lawrence Berkeley Lab, all in the Bay Area. Those four national laboratories mean that a lot of the university collaborators at Stanford and UC Davis and UC Berkeley and even some of the state schools have better close connections. Similarly, in Tennessee, Oak Ridge National Laboratory is in Oak Ridge, very near Knoxville. So University of, Texas, university of Tennessee, Knoxville has a very strong relationship with ORNL. So, it is also possible for you to think about doing a postdoc at a university that has a strong connection to one of these national laboratories. And then finally, another avenue is to consider a sabbatical or a joint appointment. So for example, it is not unusual for people to do a Fulbright, if you're a, um, a research scientist in another country, to spend a year at a national lab in the United States on a Fulbright or some other funding mechanism. Okay, so those are the ways, the pathways in. What do you have to watch out for? Well, I kind of put these into categories called pathologies. What are some patterns that if, if uh, unchecked can lead to some disappointment or at least some somewhat dead ends? So I would say in the academic pathologies, ending up doing research that is quote unquote interesting, but not useful. That is to say publishing and publishing in a particular area and sure you get your manuscripts published, but strictly speaking, the work that you're doing doesn't show high likelihood of scaling up to something that's gonna have impact. In contrast, the national lab pathology might be 
getting involved or ending up spending your career on research that is quote unquote useful, but not terribly interesting, at least not to yourself. And um, there are plenty of projects at the National Labs which are important and useful, but may not be the sort of project that you would have envisioned, but you might be constrained. In the academic pathologies, one of the worst I see is that university professors within a single department very, very rarely collaborate. Each professor is like their own island, and they have much greater likelihood of collaborating off campus than the people right down the hall. In contrast, in national labs, the collaboration environment within the laboratory is great. It's very strong. The challenge is you have so many collaborators within the laboratory that it's often hard for you to collaborate outside the laboratory. And there can be research scientists at a national lab who essentially have no collaborators outside the laboratory. And that can lead to problems later on. Another academic pathology is that a, a, a professor at a, at, a, at a university can train PhDs and produce PhDs because they are the means of getting research done. They are literally your foot soldiers in the research enterprise. But it's not necessarily thoughtful to train PhDs, especially on subjects that don't have a lot of research or um, other opportunity. In contrast, at a national lab, you can, be, you can wind up working on other people's priorities solely as a means to maintain your own funding. And in that case, you can sort of feel a little bit lost, like you don't have control over your own life. In academia, I think it is difficult and expensive to maintain a world-class laboratory, that is to say equipment. Large scale pieces of equipment, I would say pieces of equipment with a dollar price of a million dollars or more can be very expensive at a university because of all the facilities charges and the need for specialized you know, air conditioning and power supply. And university departments don't have a big supply of operational and maintenance dollars. So these big ticket items can be very expensive for a research scientist, uh, a professor at a university to maintain. In contrast, at a national lab, as I said, equipment is relatively easy to purchase because it's a one-time purchase. And it can be difficult to pay for all the people associated with a world-class research group. And so this is what I find is that in academic environments, a quote-unquote successful researcher will have a lot of grad students and postdocs and maybe a small laboratory a quote-unquote successful national lab researcher might have a very small research group, but she has access to some phenomenal facilities and, and tools that nobody else does. Finally, in the academic pathology, you can, if you're not careful, you can just end up teaching the same physics class over and over again for the rest of your life. And in the national lab, if you're not careful, you can end up running a single piece of research equipment for the rest of your life. And now well, that might be okay for some people, but some people might find that a little bit of a disappointment. So those are those pathologies. But there are joys on both sides. The academic joys are students. There really is no environment at a national lab that has as much exposure to students as an academic environment. Um, and also, the academic environment is genuinely much more flexible and much more loose. As long as you have funding to do it, there are very few checks and balances uh, and forms to fill out to get stuff done. The other thing about academia is, of course, there are academic departments, physical science departments, all over the United States, in practically every state, and certainly around the world. So you have geographic diversity. And then finally, you have a certain degree of intellectual freedom in an academic environment. If you have an idea and you can get funding for it, you can do it. The national lab toys are a little bit different. As I have talked to other um, friends at National Labs, I think the number one thing they say is the joy of having so many diverse collaborators on a single site in so many different environments. One colleague of mine said that he's changed his scientific career five times since he's been in a National Lab, and he's never once had to change his parking lot. I will say National Labs have the best toys. There really is no other environment where you can work and use the absolute most powerful tools. Uh, and that can really set you forward in your research career. Another thing many scientists love about the National Labs is that they have a nationally relevant mission. They are focused on sustainability, they're focused on basic science, big team science that makes an impact. And that, that can be very joyful. And then finally, 
one thing that national lab scientists tell me is the opportunity for interdisciplinary collaboration is so much easier at a national lab. If you are a physicist, a spectroscopist, and you have a question or idea that involves DNA or protein membranes, you can find somebody literally on the campus and have lunch with them that day. It's very easy to spark those uh, collaborations. It's not like one place is better than another place. I have had my colleagues and friends who are teaching in academia tell me things like teaching is absolutely the most thrilling experience for me. Helping spark creativity in young minds is tremendously fulfilling. And I've had other friends at national lab environments who tell me that the resources and environment are amazing. I'm totally excited by the breadth of capabilities we have here. We have literally the best tools for research and I can find collaborators in any scientific discipline all on this campus. So it's not really like one place is better or worse. A lot of it has to do with you. Now I'm gonna jump back to one of the earlier topics we discussed this summer, which was the idea of what's called customer profiling. Understanding the people who are seeking you, who are seeking what you do, and understanding what their needs are. They are your quote unquote customers. And in academia, as a young assistant professor, you have customers. Now, I know that their students are customers, but the people who are actually paying you are the department chairs and the deans. They have hired you to get work done. So it's important for you to understand what are they trying to get done? What is a department chair or a dean trying to achieve when she hires one person to fill a physics appointment in a university department? What are the great past outcomes that that dean or department chair has in her past that she's trying to replicate when she hires you? Or what are the painful past outcomes with past hires that they're trying to avoid? As you think about your career and your job search, think about the people making the hiring decision. Think about what their needs are and how your background and experience and your interests align with their needs and help them achieve their gains and avoid their pains. The same issue applies in the national labs. Instead of department chairs and deans, we have division leaders and scientific area leaders. Those two people are making the hiring decision and they're trying to get work done in their lives. And so there too, you need to ask, what are some of the great past outcomes that these division leaders and area leaders are trying to replicate when they hire you? And what are the painful past outcomes that they're trying to avoid? This idea of customer profiling, thinking of who is making the hiring decision for you as a matching of your skills, knowledge, and abilities with their needs and their hopes and their fears. That's a strategy I think that can be very helpful to help you decide whether a national lab career or an academic career is the right path for you, or maybe both. And people do go back and forth between national labs and academic appointments. All right, I'm gonna wrap this all up and I'm eager to hear your questions. So for starters, look, I hope I've convinced you in this entire series that the purpose of life and of a personal professional career is to be happy and to create meaning for yourself and for others. And so really that's the core of what you need to be thinking about as you consider a career at a national lab or any of the other careers that Crystal and APS are gonna be profiling for you in this webinar series. National labs and academias each are environments where there are physics trained scientists and they can thrive and make an impact. So it's not like one place is better for physicists than others. Both have their unique strengths. And as I showed you with the cost structure, in some cases, you might find the best is some sort of synergy and have a collaboration where you can, you can utilize the resources and the young scientists that exist in academia while simultaneously maximizing the utilization of research equipment at a national lab. That's what a user facility is after all. So determining which is better for you requires you to weigh the differences, consider the options and ask yourself where you think you can do your best work and be the most satisfied and happy. And remember, as I said before, the purpose of life in a professional career is to be happy and create meaning for yourself and for others. 
So as you do your exploration and as you watch these webinar series, I hope that you, you gain insights both about what these different environments are like, but where you think you'll be happiest and most successful. And really, that's what Crystal, Crystal and I have always hoped for you all, that you are talented, uh, you have such great uh, things to offer the world, and that we hope you, we can help you find the ideal place for you to make that impact. Okay, everybody. Well, let's move on to your questions. And I'll just remind you, as I always do, that I have written extensively on the subject of career development for scientists and engineers. And you can find many of my past articles uh, in Nature's archives. And Crystal and I uh, look forward to um, hearing from you, hearing your questions. And after Mr. COVID uh, leaves us, we look forward to seeing you at future APS annual meetings where we can continue to discuss your career. And you know, who knows? Maybe in five years or 10 years from now, Crystal will ask you to lead a webinar on what you're doing and how you made the transition from grad student or postdoc to where you are now. I guarantee you that you're not gonna believe all the places you can go, and we look forward to hearing your stories. And with that, I'm going to uh, end uh, my prepared remarks. And Crystal, why don't you tell us some of the questions that have come up so far? Yeah, Peter, the, thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, very large number of questions coming in, so I'm going to do my best to try to get through as many of them as I can and kind of um, target some some key themes. But th there's a lot of a lot of questions coming in. So um, the first thing I guess I would ask about there are several that are tied to the question of nationality and working in national yeah. labs. Um, I guess you know you kind of said that. And, and as, as I know from experience, sometimes the opportunities are limited. But can you say more about what someone who is not a U.S. citizen can, can do if they are interested in these kinds of careers? Absolutely. And first of all, I will say that my comments in this area do not reflect any policy of my laboratory, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, or the DOE. They are just my personal observations. But I have been working, I have worked both in a nuclear um, sort of classified laboratory environment, Lawrence Livermore, and I've worked in a more open science laboratory, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. So I can compare and contrast even within the DOE, okay? So for starters, people, you know and I know that science is a transnational community, that um, we are all striving to do the same thing, but whereas at a university, there is really much more focus on an individual's performance as a teacher and their performance uh, as a lab leader. And there is not really a policy dimension to the nationality of their professors. In the national lab setting, administrations come and administrations go. And some administrations can suddenly elevate senses of concern or priority or even fear about certain foreign nationals. So we do know that the federal government maintains a list of quote-unquote sensitive foreign national countries and there is currently a set of countries that the United States is genuinely on like bad diplomatic terms with and they make it hard for citizens of those countries to interact seamlessly which is what we want to do as scientists. That list, I don't even know what the current kind of list is but you can find it online and for those of you um, who are nationals in, in these countries and working in the United States, you may have already encountered some of the barriers. With respect to the DOE labs, obviously the greatest sensitivity is around the DOE laboratories that work on quote unquote classified research. So the nuclear weapons labs are the ones where they make it extremely difficult for citizens of sensitive uh, countries to work uh, seamlessly. Doesn't mean it can't be done, it just is extremely difficult. In some of the other laboratories, what we call the science laboratories, like Lawrence Berkeley Lab and Argonne, the barriers for those foreign nationals are lower, but they are not zero. Uh, and I would say that of the various countries that we have seen the greatest shift in policy, China is one, partly because China produces such great young scientists, many of whom come to the United States to do their graduate studies or postdoc studies, and they are encountering increased burdens uh, at the national labs about uh, verifying what they can do and when they can do it. I don't know 
how this will change. Certainly, as I said, administrations come and administrations go and priorities can change. But in, in this case, I would say that the national labs tend to prefer um, people from either the United States or foreign nationals who are not coming from countries that are on that sensitive list. Crystal, were there any other dimensions to that question or any other elements you think I should address? There, there, there are related uh, themes. <laughs> like I said, they're mm -hmm. just pouring in. This is wonderful. We love all your questions. Yeah. Um, so I guess two, two questions that might be related to this is, um, well, you know, can you talk about collaborations between U.S. national labs and national labs in other countries? And a kind of a related question, if you're applying for a postdoc position at a U.S. lab, is it advantageous or does it matter if your past experience, um, you know, working as a grad student or postdoc has been in another com country versus a U.S. lab? Um, it, it can be very advantageous in some places. There are some specific topics in science and in physics in particular where international collaboration is absolutely, and it's not just the norm, it's actually the, the only way to get work done. So I would say the world of high energy physics, it is very typical for research scientists in the United States to spend some time in, in Europe or other countries and for people in Europe to spend substantial amounts of time in the United States because that research community is typically focusing their attention on building only one thing right? One big tool for the entire planet to use together. So international collaboration becomes very, very critical. In contrast, as I said before, there are other topics for which collaboration, quote unquote, can be sort of frowned upon. So even, for example, high energy physicists who work on plasma physics, because some of that physics can get into the physics of nuclear weapons, a scientist can find herself uh, increasingly constrained in the sort of international collaborations that she can engage in, depending on the research she's doing at the US National Lab. One area of emerging um, priority for the US Department of Energy from a somewhat nationalistic perspective is quantum information science. And so the US DOE has just announced a big bunch of funding for quantum um, computing uh, research at the national labs and in collaborations. And that is one area that uh, the current administration has identified they're particularly concerned about quote-unquote competition from quote-unquote other countries. And so this issue of national, you know, sort of uh, kind of, you know, um, nationalism versus internationalism, that can ebb and flow with the administrations. And all I can say is, as you know, as scientists, we are a transnational community. We tend to default towards open, and uh, honest communication and sharing of technical information. And in most cases, that is absolutely the right move. But in some cases, the DOE can put policies in place to, um, to make sure that that doesn't get out of control. That's a good question. Thank you, Crystal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so another question, uh, we have several people asking about kind of what does the picture look like if you're working in a national lab, depending on what your degree is. So PhD versus master's versus bachelor's. Are there opportunities for folks who are not, you know, PhDs, obviously postdoc positions and things like that, but what about the other degree paths? That's a great question. I would say that um, people uh, who are coming in before they've completed a PhD, there are two sort of pathways that I've seen. One is, they will come in with a master's degree and potentially get involved in a research program and actually get, end up getting a PhD as a part in the, in, the, in the course of doing their job. And I have seen this where people come in with a master's degree in a technician or sort of staff um, uh, uh, a scientist role and then have gone back and gotten a PhD while simultaneously staying and working at the National Lab. And of course it provides a convenient place to get your research done and you're employed at the same time, so it could be a sweet deal. In the engineering side of things, a PhD is often a lot less necessary and industry experience can be much more relevant. So for example, in engineering disciplines such as mechanical engineering, metallurgy, um, electrical engineering, et cetera, it could be that um, somebody has years, uh, just a master's degree, but then has years of relevant experience with a particular technology. Those people with a master's degree can come into the research 
pathway and they can advance in the research pathway. And so even senior managers at national laboratories, not all of them have a PhD. That being said, particularly at the quote unquote science laboratories, the PhD is generally recognized to be the most relevant degree, partly because of the experience it's given you uh, in doing research. And so I think that that even though you may be working on large projects and you may not be publishing very much, I think that the national labs still see that the PhD and researcher profile is the sort of profile that, that is appropriate for many staff positions, but it's not always the case. Let me give you one final example. Um, there is often the case where people can move from um, sort of a, a techn technical and te you know sort of a technical background into a managerial background. And you know, strictly speaking, a senior business manager at a national laboratory might not necessarily need to have a PhD, but she would probably benefit enormously from having an MBA. So there are also those trade-offs. It's a great question. Thank you, Crystal. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, there's just so many great questions coming in. I think let's do one more, and then there's a couple of announcements that I want to make that are relevant to some of the questions that are coming in. We've got a couple of folks asking about having a strong application and also um, the kind of on-ramp ramps that you uh, mentioned. So first of all, are there are there particular types of projects that a person could work on for their PhD thesis or you know, in graduate school that would strengthen their um, odds of being hired into a national lab environment? And then also does the best on-ramp to becoming staff vary between national labs? Uh, one person says they've worked at Fermilab as a grad student for years and had the impression that being a Fermilab postdoc rarely led to a staff position. Interesting. Well, so for starters, the answer is yes. The different There are things you can do in terms of the grad graduate school work you do, both the where and the what, that can have an influence in, in your advancement into a national lab career. And the second is um, it does matter lab by lab. Um, so for example, let's start with kind of the, I would say not the hardest end, but so Lawrence Berkeley Lab and some of the other science labs um, recruit from their postdoc pools, but a minority of postdocs might advance into a term position. So I think at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, it's typically fewer than one in five postdocs will stay on in the lab in a term position and then some fraction of those get converted to staff. So whereas it's very common as a staff member to have been a postdoc at that national lab, if you're a postdoc at that national lab, your odds of be eventually becoming a staff member are you know 20% or so. In contrast, some of the classified laboratories, um, for example, not just the nuclear weapons laboratories, but for example, National Energy Technology Laboratory or Idaho National Lab that work on um, you know, uh, sensitive subjects like nuclear power, et cetera, et cetera. If you come in as a grad student and your research and research interests are highly aligned with that topic, I think the national labs uh, might be strongly, much more strongly interested in converting you to staff because there are not a lot of academic departments, right, that focus on those things. So it depends a little bit on how specialized the laboratory is. There are some of the, last, the national labs that frankly have very specialized research. Somebody mentioned Fermilab and the, the possibility of converting from a postdoc to a staff position at Fermilab. You're right, the direct conversion rate at Fermilab is not high, but if you are a high energy physicist and you have a postdoc at Fermilab, your network then extends to all the other laboratories, both in the United States and abroad, that are working on high energy physics. And if you stay in that field, your next step might not be Fermilab again, it might be CERN or it might be you know, Slack. With time, however, with that experience you gain, especially in some of those other research environments, if that research ends up and that experience aligns with the needs of Fermilab, it can be very much the case that having been a postdoc, you're familiar with the place, and then three, five, eight years later, you come back and you're a very attractive um, hiring opportunity for them. So it sometimes happens that you need to move around a little bit before you finally settle in your staff position. 
Let's do one more question, Crystal. Well, Peter, there, well, there's a couple, there's a couple questions. Okay, that yeah, let's do one more. But um, so I've had a few folks asking about the differences between national lab careers versus industry. Uh, how are those different? Do people move back and forth? Um, and I, I just want to remind folks, in case you weren't here from the very beginning of the uh, presentation, that we're also, if you, if you're curious about industry <laughs> careers. We're launching a success in industry careers webinar series, and we're going to be covering lots of different topics that are that are relevant to industry careers. So, I'd like you to to definitely sign up for that. You know, if you go to our um, our sign up, which is on our main uh, webinar page, you can sign up for webinars and check success in industry careers, and you will be signed up for those. Um, I also and I would also say, Crystal, you know. For the people on this audience, if there is a particular career path that interests you and you don't see it represented in Crystal's current roster of future webinars, write Crystal an email. Give her the suggestion that you'd like to hear more about careers in X. And I'm sure Crystal, Crystal has a huge and extensive network of physicists who are now in a wide variety of careers. And she'd be happy to assemble some additional information. Um, I think this is a great webinar series, Crystal. And you know, as I reflect on my life as a grad student, I never had anything like this with windows into these various career paths. So thank you for doing this. Of course, of course. Um, and then another uh, set of questions, and, and I'll, I'll give some advice and then you can kind of round that out if you have additional advice. People are asking, where can you go to actually find National Lab positions? How, you know, And I, I wanna say, I wanna do a quick plug for our um, job board. Sorry, that's wrong. Careers.aps.org. Yep. It's careers. <laughs> uh, to everybody, we have tons of postings for postdocs for, at National Labs all year round. And I will also say that we're kind of getting into a season where a lot of National Labs are starting to hire at the APS Division of Plasma Physics meeting. If any of you have ever been to that or considering going this year, we're having a virtual meeting. We're also, we always have a job fair where uh, national labs recruit for over 60 postdoc positions every year. And I don't expect that things will slow down uh, a lot necessarily for them. Uh, we're gonna do a virtual job fair. So please consider going to the Division of Plasma Physics meeting where there will be a virtual job fair and lots of national labs recruiting for postdoc positions. Peter, do you have additional advice for that? Uh, I would simply say all the national labs have a very um, uh, uh, openings part of their website and positions are advertised there all the time. However, my strong recommendation is that by the time a position is advertised, it is, it is often the case they already have some strong candidates in mind. Start figuring out opportunities in the national lab is before they advertise that position. That's where networking comes in. We talked about networking this summer. And at our annual meeting in the spring, the workshop that Crystal and I run, we go extensively into the need and opportunities of networking and how that can help you uncover opportunities before they're advertised. Yep. Okay, this is great. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up here. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have for the official webinar. A couple folks were asking, you know, can we get a, a recording? Yes, if you are registered for this event, you will get an email in 48 hours containing the recording of this presentation. Um, and certainly you can also uh, follow up by sending an email to webinars at aps.org and we can uh, forward the question for comment or try to respond to the um, question ourselves. I've also put together a quick survey um, and it would be really wonderful if you could take a moment to fill out this survey as you leave to give us a little feedback on the presentation. We really value um, hearing from you. Uh, okay, well, that's it. Thank you, Peter, again, so much for an engaging presentation. You're welcome, Crystal. And uh, you know we'll 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 be in touch. Everyone else, uh, have a have a great day. American Physical Society. Bye, bye everybody. Bye bye. <laughs> American Physical Society. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved. <laughs>